Okay. Hey guys. I am here. Um, how's it going? So, let me get all this set up. Um, so today I thought I would just go through and um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Just run through this practice test. Um, this AP chemistry diagnostic test. It's 50 questions. Um, we'll go through, do that. Uh, if people start showing up and wanting specific things, we can always go back and, you know, quit and do that. So, let's get started. All right, begin. Okay. So consider the following reaction, solid copper plus two silver ions uh, going to two uh, silver ions and two si uh, silver solid. What is the oxidizing agent and what is the reducing agent? Okay, so this is kind of an older, uh, an older question. Uh, I know that the AP Chem test has switched things around a little bit they don't really care so much about oxidizing agent and reducing agent anymore um one sec let me make sure i can one sec let me make sure i can okay yeah i am uh you know my mic is on good so um the thing you have to remember is that the oxidizing agent is the thing that is being reduced. The reducing agent is the thing that is being oxidized. Um, so the reducing agent is the thing doing reducing. Uh, the other thing is being reduced. So that means the, the reducing agent is being oxidized. Okay, so uh, for this, the thing you need to remember is that lovely acronym uh, oil rig so oil rig oxidation is loss reduction is gain so which one of these guys is being reduced and which one is being uh, oxidized the silver here is gaining an electron it's going from a plus to a neutral charge so this is gaining an electron so therefore it must be being it is being reduced uh, copper here is losing electrons going from neutral to two plus so it is losing electrons so it is being oxidized so with all that in mind um, which one is the reducing agent which one's the uh, oxidizing agent uh, if silver is being uh, reduced it must be the oxidizing agent so uh, there's that copper is the reducing agent um, great the a couple of these so no redox chemistry occurs you can tell that's not true things are being oxidized and reduced um, anytime you have a reducing agent there must be an oxidizing agent same way here Anytime these things things are being oxidized, there must be a reducing agent. So there is that one. Select it. Move on. Uh, which of the following compounds contains an atom that does not satisfy the octet rule? Um, ah, ha, ha. okay. So again, um, you could go through and... Um, uh, draw the Lewis structure for all of these um, you know you should know at this point that um, uh, boron trichloride boron trifluoride those type of things uh, do not satisfy the octet rule uh, CO2 you know satisfies the octet rule so you can get rid of anything with a 2 uh, that's A 
um, C and D, you know one does, so it can either be uh, A or D, so it must be four. N O two does not satisfy the octet rule. Um, you can check that real quick if you would like. Um, just go through and look at what this looks like. Um, oh, right, it's because of hybridization. So if we one, two, three, four, five. Um, whoop. There. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, these two will pair up. These two will also pair up. And then one of these will come here and pair up with this electron, um, making, if you want to kind of clean this up, this type of bond um, where uh, it'll flip-flop back and forth. So this one, number four, NO2, does not satisfy the octet rule. Uh, go. All right. Uh, the difference in atomic radii of fluorine and lithium is most similar to the difference of atomic radii in which pair of elements? Um, all right. So this type of question is looking just to, for properties, um, without even looking at uh, that. One thing you can try to do is just look what is in the same group as fluorine, what's in the same group as lithium. Let me pull up P table real quick. And so lithium has sodium with it, fluorine has chlorine in it as well. They're both one period below. So sodium and chlorine look like they're good bets. And sure enough, sodium and chlorine are right there. Why does fluorine have a smaller atomic radius than carbon? Um, again, we can, we can go back to the uh, periodic table. Fluorine and carbon are on the same period. Um, remember that if they're in the same period, they will have the same um, energy level which means the electrons are roughly the same distance apart, um, or at least on like the same order of distance apart. Uh, the only thing that can change that distance then isn't the, is how strong of a nucleus uh, you have. In other words, how many protons you have in your nucleus. So carbon has less protons than fluorine, so fluorine is going to have a stronger positive charge in the center, the, and then um, the electrons are going to get pulled in further because of that. Okay, so let's see here. Fluorine is more electronegative than carbon. Fluorine has more charged particles attracting the electron cloud to the nucleus. That looks good. Whoop, let's go back real quick and get the rest of them. Uh, fluorine is most likely, uh, halogens have a lot, no. Halogens do not have larger atomic radii. Um, fluorine is more electronegative. Fluorine is the most electronegative element. Fluorine is farther down the group. That's not true. Yeah, so our current choice still seems the best. All right. Uh, a chemist combines 300 mils of 0.3 molar sodium sulfate solution and 200 mils of 0.4 molar uh, barium chloride solution. How many grams of precipitate forms? Um, so if you want to look to see what is... Th this, you have to think about your solubility rules. 
And then you also need to think about how many moles of the substance is being um, uh, formed. Uh, where should we start? Uh, well, let's just go through this kind of step by step. Um, this is going to be a double replacement reaction. So we're going to have the sulfate mixing with the barium and the sodium mixing with the chloride. Uh, does sodium and chloride, sodium chloride, is that insoluble? No, no. Uh, you should know that just from, you know, life. Um, but if not, you can think uh, about your solubility rules of sodium, or basically all your group ones, uh, nitrates, and ammonia are going to be uh, soluble in water. The other things, maybe, maybe not, but for the most part, those that's going to take care of most of your solubility rules. Barium sulfate um, is going to be the thing forming this, the um, the precipitate. Now, the question is, how much of each of these are we going to have? So we have point four. Can I make this a little bit larger? Size, there we go. So 0.4 moles per liter. Um, and we have 200 mils. So 200 milliliters or 0.2 liters. So then the liters are gonna cancel. So 0.4 times 0.2, uh, let's get a calculator out. 0.4 times 0.2, two. So we have two moles of barium showing up. Um, we need to see if we have more or less moles of the sulfate showing up. Um, so we do that. Uh, you can kind of might do this a little bit uh, there, or know what's going to be happening here. 0.3 moles per liter times 0.3 liters. Liters cancel. And we can check out and see what this is. So 0.3 times 0 0.3, 0.09. So, oh, I did, I did uh, divide it by last time. Sorry about that. Um, so, 0.09, the other one is uh, 0.2 times 0 0.4, uh, 0.024. So it's going to be 0 0.09 moles. Uh, 0.09, I'm sorry, the we want the limiting reactant. So it's going to be, what is going on here? I'm glad I have a history. Um, so... 0.2 times 0 0.4, 0 0.08. Okay, this is going to be the, our limiting reactant. Our barium is going to be the limiting reactant. All right, so um, we're going to have point oh eight moles of barium sulfate. Uh, we know it's going to be 0 0.08 moles because of the limiting reactant. So, 0 0.08 moles. And now we need to figure out how many grams per mole we have. Uh, to do that, we're going to need to go back to the periodic table. Let's pull this out. Um... It's going to be barium, which is 137.33, plus uh, sulfate, so sulfur, 32.06, plus, and then 4 times 16 for oxygen. So 233 times that 0 0.08 
it's going to be about 18.6. So 18.7. And there we go. So 18.7. All right. Uh, what is the IUPAC name for this molecule? Uh, this is something I think that AP uh, used to uh, have quite a bit of, uh, and that's organic nomenclature. I don't know how much they're going to be doing that anymore. From what I see, not terrible much. Um, uh, this may be one of the last things I actually talk about. Um, but if you are interested, this is kind of how you can do it. Um, nomenclature, organic nomenclature is a very German way of doing things. Um, so first you figure out, is this an alkane, an alkyne, or an alkene? There's no double bonds anywhere. Um, so this is going to be a, uh, an, al uh, an alkyne. Or sorry, an alkane. Uh, so that means A N E uh, is going to be your uh, thing, except this is a alcohol. So you replace the A N E with A N O L. So it's going to be this one, this one, or this one. Uh, oh no, not this one because it's E N O L. So it's going to be B or uh, E. So you need to know, uh, then the next thing you need to know is how many carbons there are, one, two, three. Uh, one carbon is meth, so methane, methyl, uh, methanol. Uh, two carbons is eth, so ethane, ethanol, uh, ethene, etc. cetera. Um, then four is prop, so propane, propanol, propenol, propene. So it's propanol, propanol, go. All right, a large number of molecules begin moving very fast, rarely bumping into one another and taking up the entire space available to them. As the temperature drops and the kinetic energy of the particles decreases, the particles move slowly and run into each other more often, eventually form a lattice st structure only slightly moving. What is this process called? So the temperature is dropping and then forming a lattice structure only slightly moving. So if it's a lattice structure, you know this is going to be a solid. So you're going from a, uh, a gas, that's what this kind of sounds like, very fast, rarely bumping into one another and taking up the entire space available to them. This is going from a gas to a solid. Um, decreasing, yes, it is decreasing in temperature, but that's not what the process is called. Um, condensation, then freezing. Could be condensation and freezing. Sublimation, then freezing. It sounds like, because there's no, uh, they eventually, okay, so they, uh, they run into each other more often. This question is very strange, because I think this part, as the temperature drops, kinetic energy in the particle decreases, the particles move more slowly and run into each other more often. They eventually form a lattice structure, only slightly moving. I think that we're just talking about freezing here. Uh, for uh, just so you know, uh, vaporization is whenever things go from a liquid to a uh, a gas. Sublimation is whenever things go from a gas to a solid, uh, and freezing is going from a liquid uh, to a. I mean, I guess it would be sublimation then freezing. Yeah, I'm gonna go sublimation then freezing. All right. The question was written oddly. Okay. 
Uh, molecule A has twice the mass of molecule B. A sample of each molecule is released into separate identical containers. Which molecule has the higher rate of diffusion? Ha ha. So um, this is the one where, whoop, get back here. Um, you need to remember that this is um, rate one, rate two equals, and then the square root of um, mass two, mass one. So the thing to remember is that the heavier the thing, the slower the rate of, of diffusion. If molecule A is twice the mass of molecule B, molecule B will be, will diffuse twice as fast. Okay. So, molecule B. Okay. If, if a container holds one mole of hydrogen, 2.5 moles of helium, two moles of oxygen, and a total pressure of four atmospheres, what is the partial pressure of hydrogen gas? Okay. So, the total number of moles here is 5.5 um, so 2 over 5.5 that's going to be the percentage of how much oxygen we have uh, 2 divided by 5.5 is 3.63 um, so this is going to be kind of percentage of, of the, our molar percentage of oxygen and then four atmospheres is the total um, total pressure. So if the molar percentage is this, um, uh, we can see uh, how much of this pressure is contributed to that of oxygen. Remember, just the number of particles matters here. Nothing else really matters. Not the mass, Not nothing like that. Um, so this times 4, 1.45. Hey, 1.45. Uh, which of the following was not an assumption of the kinetic molecular theory of gases? KMT. Um, collisions between gas particles are elastic. Yes, they are. I'm sorry, they're non-elastic. Um, they're like ball. They're balls. Um, the volumes of the particles of gases are negligible. Yes. Um, the kinetic energy of gas particles are different for all gases at a certain temperature. Of gas particles are different for all gases at a certain temperature. Yes, this is. I think this is trying to ta uh, describe that distribution where they're uh, they're all different. Gas particles do not experience attraction or repulsion. Yes, uh, these two are the things you need to think of whenever you think of um, the the real gas law, the the van der Waals equation. And gas particles are in random continuous motion. Yes. So, yeah, collisions between gas particles are um, elastic. No, they're not. They're inelastic. Um, so I think that is the correct answer. Um, inelastic as in, think of like billiard balls. Uh, a billiard ball is an inelastic collision. Um, what volume of chlorine gas at some temperature is needed to react with 14.2 grams of sodium to form sodium chloride at 1.72 atmospheres? This seems like an um, a ideal gas law problem, if I've ever seen one. Um, and a stoichiometry problem. So we need to figure out how many moles of sodium this is. Um, sodium 
22.99. Let's just say 23. So, uh, here we go. Let's pop this real quick. Um, so, we have uh, 14.2 grams, and we need to switch this to grams per mole. This is going to be 23 grams. Grams cancel. And this is going to get us moles of sodium. And then once we have moles of sodium, we can plug this into the ideal gas law. And um, oh, no, no. Uh, but, but there's going to be one more step after this the stoichiometry step. Um, for every one sodium chloride we're gonna need I'm sorry for every two sodium chloride we're gonna use one chlorine gas because remember chlorine gas is diatomic all right so this will get us moles of chlorine gas and then once we have moles of chlorine then we can plug that into the ideal gas law all right so let's pull this real quick and okay uh, 14.2 divided by 23 divided by 2.3 so let's just say 0.3 clean this up is there a way to reset this erase all ha nice um, okay so 0.3 is our moles 0.3. Ideal gas law, remember, is PV equals nRT. Um, we have number of moles. We're trying to get uh, volume. So we're going to put pressure on this side. 0 0.3 times the ideal gas law. Um, we're doing atmospheres and Celsius. So we are gonna need to change the Celsius to Kelvin. Um, oh geez, I'm forgetting the ideal gas law. Um, let's see here, gas constant R. Um, we don't need joules, here we go. Liter, atmosphere, mole, Kelvin, uh, 0.082. times 0 0.082 uh, and then 45 plus uh, Uh, convert this to Kelvin. So, I am off today. Uh, plus, what is it, 215, yeah, 215. So, 260 divided by 1.72 atmospheres and this should get us volume okay so 0.3 times 0 0.082 times 260 divided by 1.72 uh, 3.17 I think it may have been off. I think I was off there. I'm gonna say 4.7. We'll see what it is. Uh, magnesium will combine with oxygen gas to form magnesium oxide according to the balanced equation below. Okay. Um, 65 grams, how many grams 
Okay, this is just a straight stoic problem. Um, so if this is a stoichiometry problem, we're going to start with 65 grams of magnesium oxide. We need to switch to grams to moles. Then we need to go from magnesium oxide to magnesium. Then we need to go from moles of magnesium to grams of magnesium. And we got it. So let's just figure out what all these numbers are going to be. Uh, it's two and two, so that's going to be nice. Uh, periodic table, magnesium is 24.3. So here is 24.3. And then plus 16, 40.3, 40.3. Okay. Now, we have all of that, we can just plug and chug. 65 divided by 40.3 times 2 divided by 2 times 24.3. 39.2. There it is. Okay. Uh, 50 sam gram sample of metal was heated ah, and then quickly transferred to an insulated container containing 50 grams of, of water. This is a specific heat question. We haven't gotten into specific heats yet. Uh, we will uh, get into specific heats during thermo in about three weeks or so. Um, Let's go ahead and uh, I'm just going to pick a, a random one. Well, let's see if I can't f just figure it out without actually teaching it. Uh, which of the following can be concluded? Final temperature of the water. Oh, so just water increased whenever you put a piece of metal into it. Um, and the final temperature of the water was 30 degrees so the water only only r was raised thir uh, 5 degrees celsius even though the metal of the same mass was 95 so a specific heat is basically the quality of a substance to take on um, heat how how well can it um, deal with heat um, so specific heat of metal is greater than that of water. Uh, no, water has a huge amount of, a huge specific heat. Uh, water gained an amount of thermal energy that was more than the amount of thermal energy lost by the metal. No, those two things were equal. The, metal, the energy had to left the metal and got, gained, uh, or was gained by the water. Uh, so yeah, it, was, it would be this one. So just so you know, it was specific heat of water is greater than that of the metal. Um, water has a very high specific heat. That's one reason why it takes so much energy uh, to uh, heat water. Uh, think about how long does it take to heat up a piece of metal versus heat up the same, um, like, same amount of water. It takes a long time one reason why firefighters use water because it takes a lot of energy in order to raise the temperature of water okay uh which of the following would be would best buffer a solution from ph four to six this is going to be um one of those uh things that we will learn uh, when we do that acid and base thing, you might f 
figure it out already um, just by looking at these KAs, or these aren't KAs, these are PKAs, uh, but P just means negative log, so just look at the exponent. Um, what you want for a buffer is, um, well, yeah, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to pick the first one so we can move on. Uh, which of the following compounds is a Lewis acid? Um, oh man, <laughs> we're not actually dealing with Lewis acids anymore. Uh, which one can, uh, basically, which one is a electron acceptor? Which ones can accept electrons? Oh, uh, let's see. H2O? H2O is not even in the list. Come on, question. Um, it's going to be uh, the, the ammonia. Uh, okay. Um, assuming the two solutions are additive, uh, what's the pH of the resulting solution? Uh, essentially, we're just going to go through and um, see what, how many moles of OH do we get out of this guy? How many moles of OH are we getting out of this guy? And then put it over 100 milliliters or 0.1 liters. Um, so if it's going to be, this is going to be 0.5 moles. And if you want to see of how that is, let's show you. So we do 1.0 moles over one liter. That's the molarity of this. And then we're going to multiply this by 0.05 liters. So 0.05 uh, moles of OH is what comes out of here. Uh, same thing here, but this time you have to remember that we're going to be multiplying this by 2 because we're going to have 0.05 moles of barium hydroxide, but once this disassociates, we're going to have two of these guys, so we need to multiply it by 2. Um, so that would make it 0.1. Uh, we add these together, and we are going to get 0. Point one five moles moles uh, over uh, 100 milliliters or 0 0.1 liters this will get us 0.5 divided by 0.1 uh, a concentration of 1.5 molar OH okay now, we need to go through and figure out the pKa, or I'm sorry, the, the, the pOH of this, which is going to be, um, hold me on, one sec, negative, no, 1.5 log negative, there we go, which is going to be uh, negative 0.17, then we have to also remember that we need to take this and um, subtract 14 from it. Wait, no, I'm sorry, not subtract 14. Uh, add 14. Uh, it's going to be like 13.8. There we go. So it's going to be, no, I'm sorry, it's going to be 14.18. Uh, Let me go do that one more time. So 1.5 log negative. Okay, so there's that. Now we need to do 14 minus that. We have no answer. 
answer. Copy. Molecular shape of NH3 is trigonal pyramidal. Um, the reason it's trigonal pyramidal is remember it's um, there is. Let me just show you the electron dot notation or the Lewis structure of this guy, and then there is a. Um, lone pair off to the side. So there are four electron groups. This thing is going to be tetrahedral um, as of the electron geometry, but we're looking at the molecular geometry, which means these guys we don't really see. Uh, so it does kind of look like this with uh, this coming out towards you, this one kind of heading backward and this coming with the screen. And then the this bulb of the electron cloud up top. So it is pyramidal. Okay. Which of the following describes an isot which of the following describes an isotope two C thirteen? I think it should be of. Alright. So carbon has six protons, and since it has 13 things, it should have seven neutrons. So six protons, seven neutrons. Okay. Uh, chemical... So we know this chemical, whatever it is, has a 60, uh, 76 protons. Only has these two. Um, these two isotopes, the atomic weight is listed as this. What is the relative abundance of each, each isotope? So remember with isotopes they're just the when you're looking at the average weight what we're saying here is on average we have a lot more 152 than we do 154 if they were 50 50 then the atomic weight would be 153 exactly here we have 152 and then just a little bit over 152, which means a very small amount of them are 154. Oh God, they're wanting you to actually calculate it. Um, it's gonna be, so you know there's enough information. It's not 50-50 and it's definitely not mostly 154. It's gonna be one of these two. Uh, if you want to go through and actually calculate it, you can by, um, and since this is multiple choice, it's going to make it a lot easier to do uh, 152 times 0.9625 plus 154, uh, whoop, whoop, whoop. one sec, go back, go back, go back. 152 times 0.9625 and then we're going to add the following thing 154 times 0 0.0375 and yeah there's the number is uh, the same number as the mass so this is what they have Okay, uh, seeing as no one is here, um, at least I only have one viewer, it looks like, um, this is gonna be my last question. 
and then we're gonna just quit and see the results and see how well I did. Hopefully it was 20 out of 20, but I imagine I missed a few just because I'm, I'm not really, uh, that, that, there was one question that really didn't seem right to me. But whatever, let's find out. Sodium will react with oxygen and form an ionic compound. Which of the following is false concerning the, this, uh, this interaction? Electrons is not equally shared. Well, electrons aren't shared at all. You see, this is what I mean. Electrons aren't shared. So I mean, I, this one, this one is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mark this one as like, potentiality. Uh, in this con uh, compound, oxygen is the anion and the sodiums are the cations. This is true. I guess I shouldn't put a check mark there. I should put a question mark. There we go. Sodium has a higher electronegativity than oxygen. This is just blatantly false. Um, the Oxygen and two sodiums are given stable octets. True. Ionic compound has an overall neutral charge. True. So, yeah, this one seems it. I think what they just mean here is that they're not shared. Therefore, this is still true. Um, that's kind of weird to me, though. All right. There's that. All right. Quit now. See results. Uh, no, thanks. Oh, no, I missed quite a few. All right. 30, 30%. Oh, 30% total. All right, let's see what, which ones we actually got wrong. Here we go. Yeah, this is the one I was talking about. Uh, condensation, then freezing. View explanation. All right. See, where, where in here does it talk about them going to a liquid phase? I call BS varsitytutors.com. Um, slowly and run into each other more often. Sure, that kind of describes that, but if that's the case, then I would also talk about here where they no longer take up the entire space available to them. Um, all right, whatever. Um, are different. Uh, okay, so wait, they they are elastic. Uh, and is the same for all gases of a given temperature. This is the opposite of what is stated. The kinetic theory of gases: the average kinetic energy of gas is proportional to temperature, and is the same for all gases at a given temperature. I mean, gases have different masses, therefore the kinetic. Oh no! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I see. What, I see what they're talking about now. Yeah. So I was thinking about how different gases have different masses, um, but okay. Uh, this is the one I skipped. Um, oh, I thought this was ammonia in H4. I thought that was ammonium, not ammonia. Wait, what? Six protons, six neutrons would be C12. An isotope. Am I wrong on this? An element is defined which describes an isot. Oh, an isotope 2. Which, as in, in other words, what is an isotope of C13? Give an example of an isotope or describe an isotope. So you could also have described like C14 oh okay not 
do not describe C13, describe a different isotope of carbon that's not C13. Gross. All right. Well, all right then. Okay. Well, this has been fun. Um, but since there's only a single person here and I'm just screaming to the void, I'm going to go ahead and log off for now. Uh, I might continue on with this later. Um, um, if you're interested in doing one of these, varsitytutors.com, some of their questions are not exactly AP style questions, but they're good to make sure that you at least know some of these concepts. Um, so go ahead and try that. Have a good one, guys.